Um, first of all, thank you so much uh, for having me. It's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, the, the book opens with an example that I think is going to be particularly and maybe painfully uh, familiar to those of us who live here in the Bay Area, uh, which is the, the problem of finding a place to live. Now, uh, in, a, in an, any normal consumer context where you have to make a decision about choosing the thing that you want, uh, the, the typical operating procedure is you look at an array of options, you think about the one that you like the best or has the best properties, and then you choose that. Um, unfortunately, when you are in a housing market as aggressive uh, as the Bay Area, you do not have the luxury to spend all this time fact-finding and then make a decision. So if you're a renter, you perhaps have had the experience of um, you know, Craigslist posts that, that go up and come down within minutes, um, you know, going to an open house, and it seems like the person who ends up getting the apartment is the one that can, you know, physically force a deposit check on the landlord the first. Um, and in, in the case of uh, buying a home, you know, you, you look at a place on a Saturday or a Sunday, they start taking offers Tuesday, and then it's over by Wednesday. So in each case, you're faced uh, with a scenario where you don't have the ability to evaluate a bunch of options, uh, then think about the one you like the most and choose it. Rather, you are in a position where at each step of the way you have to make an irreversible decision, uh, an irreversible commitment. Either you take the thing in front of you, never knowing what else might be out there, um, or you hold out for something better, or you hold out to gather more information. But doing so might cost you that opportunity in front of you, which might be your best opportunity. So what do you do? And you know, it, it's kind of a cruel scenario um, verging almost on paradox. How do you try to make an informed decision when, when the very act of trying to inform yourself may cost you your best opportunity? Um, well, fortunately, it's not a paradox. And there is an answer. And I am happy to share it with you tonight. The answer is 37%. Um, if you want the very best odds of getting the very best place, spend the first 37% of your time. Uh, so if you've given yourself, let's say, a month to find a new apartment, 37% uh, of that is 11 days. So for the first 11 days, leave the checkbook at home. You are purely calibrating. You are purely gathering information. After that point, be prepared to commit deposit check and all to the very first place you see that's better than everything that you saw in that first 37%. This is not merely an intuitively satisfying compromise between looking and leaping. This is the provably optimal result. Um, and we know this because the problem that we face when we try to find some place to live in the Bay Area uh, belongs to a category of problems known to mathematicians and computer scientists as optimal stopping problems. Um, and the, the basic structure of an optimal stopping problem where you face a sequence of opportunities and at each step in the sequence must make um, an irreversible commitment. Um, many people have argued that this describes uh, not only our search for housing, but also our search for love. Um, and there have, been, there have been some who've been so bold as to apply the 37% rule directly to their dating life um, and just define some interval of time over which they want to find a mate, you know, let's say between ages 18 and 40. Um, just quickly run, run the numbers and find 37% of that interval. It's 26.1 and just decide that this is the place uh, where dating changes from just being out there having fun to things getting serious. Um, of course, it doesn't always work out so well, and we'll talk a little bit about some famous cases of uh, computer scientists going wildly astray with their personal lives as a result. Um, but it all depends on the assumptions that you're willing to make about love. Now, the, the thesis of the book uh, which is a collaboration uh, between myself and my longtime friend, Tom Griffiths, who's a cognitive scientist at UC Berkeley. Um, the thesis is quite simple. Uh, there is a 
set of problems that all of us face in everyday life as a result of having finite time and finite space and finite information and, and limited processing power. Um, things like finding an apartment or deciding what restaurant to go out to eat, um, organizing our bookshelves, how we manage our time and, and our priorities. And we think of these things as intrinsically human problems. But the, the moral of the book is they're not. Uh, they, in fact, correspond very closely to a set of some of the canonical problems in computer science, which gives us an opportunity uh, to learn something genuinely relevant about how to make decisions in our own lives by looking at the quality that these problems have within computer science and the, and the characteristics of their optimal solutions. The book follows this uh, line of argument through ultimately 12 different domains, and we'll, we'll talk uh, in detail about two of them tonight, and obviously I'm happy to, to discuss the others uh, during the Q&A. Uh, and they are optimal stopping and the explore-exploit trade-off. So optimal stopping is this class of problems that, that yields this 37% rule. Um, and uh, the 37% the rule originally comes from the most famous optimal stopping problem of them all, which is called the secretary problem. And the secretary problem uh, frames this in a uh, job uh, hiring context where you imagine yourself as the boss of some enterprise, you're trying to hire a secretary, and candidates show up, and they show up in random order, and for one reason or another, you are constrained to interview them one at a time, and then after each interview, hire them on the spot and send everyone else home, or keep the search going, but you lose the ability to change your mind and bring that person back. Um, it, the secretary problem entered the popular imagination through the famous mathematical column of Martin Gardner in 1960. But the problem itself goes back to the late 1940s. And in fact, the first known discussion of this problem is in a lecture by the mathematician Merrill Flood uh, in a talk that he was giving at Princeton in, I believe it was 1949. And Flood, even at this very early stage, already seemed to have the problem's romantic connotations in mind. You see, Flood's daughter uh, was taking the minutes at this math conference, and she was only 18 years old and had begun a re relationship with a much older man. Flood disapproved and wondered how he might be able to communicate his disapproval to his daughter. Um, and so knowing that she would be taking the minutes of this meeting, he got up and gave a talk about this problem of how do you know when you know, to really commit to something. And ironically, at the time, the 37% solution was not yet known. But he hoped that she might be able to infer that the correct answer is probably more than one. Um, so the story does end with her breaking up with this guy. So it's a, it's a happy ending in that sense. Um, but it doesn't necessarily always work out so well. And again, it depends on the assumptions that you're bringing into the problem. Um, so one of, the, one of the best examples of this comes from the Carnegie Mellon professor of operations research, Michael Trick. Uh, Michael Trick. Uh, was in graduate school and you know, looking for love, trying to make sense of his, his personal life. And all of a sudden, it dawns on him, oh my god, dating is basically just a secretary problem. So he runs the numbers. Uh, he determines that 26.1 years old is the age after which he should be willing to settle down and commit to the first person that he meets who's better than everyone else that he's dated already. Uh, he meets the woman who fits that criteria, and so he knows exactly what to do. He proposes on the spot. <laughs> and she turns him down. What? <laughs> so Michael Trick encountered firsthand one of the ways in which real life can diverge from the assumptions of the classical secretary problem. And specifically, he encountered what mathematicians know as rejection. That is the technical term in, in the literature. 
Uh, fortunately, there is uh, an algorithm in these cases too. And so, for example, if you have a 50% chance of being rejected every time you make your offer, then the optimal strategy switches to being willing to commit uh, just 25% of the way into the pool. And if your first offer is rejected, then you just keep going and try again. So th the moral here is propose early and often. Uh, fortunately, this story ends happily for Trick as he goes on to meet the love of his life several years later. Another person who uh, grappled with the kind of sequential nature of courtship was the famous astronomer Johannes Kepler. After the death of Kepler's first wife, he embarked on this uh, kind of impressively arduous quest to find the absolutely perfect second wife uh, for him and his children. And he starts getting his friends to set him up with various women. Uh, he really likes woman number four. Um, he writes in his diary because of her tall build and athletic body. Um, but nonetheless, he, he feels he should continue on with his search. Uh, he likes number five even better. Uh, and she seems to really get along with the kids and, and there's just a comfort there. Um, but he continues his search ultimately uh, dating uh, a dozen women in, in all, before realizing with this feeling of dread at the pit of his stomach that he's made a huge mistake. And in fact, number five is the, is the love of his life here. And so he hops the next train to Regensburg and uh, tries to apologize for the, the half dozen other people that he's been dating since. And if she's still possibly interested in taking him back, would, would she agree to marry him? Fortunately for Kepler, she agrees. Um, so Kepler experienced a, a property that mathematicians know as recall, or the ability to recall a previous candidate and, and still make an offer. Um, in his diary, Kepler really beats himself up for having continued to search for people after meeting this woman number five, uh, who was so great. Um, and he, in a letter to a confidant, bemoans what he calls his restlessness and doubtfulness. You know, what, why was it that I was, I was possessed by this restlessness and doubtfulness that made me continue searching? Um, but it may make Kepler feel a little bit better, although it may make a second wife feel less good, to know that when you have the ability to recall past candidates, restlessness and doubtfulness are in fact part of the optimal strategy, and you should not make any offers until you've seen at least 61% of the pool. Um, and if there is no one in the remaining 39% uh, who is better than who you saw in the first 61%, then get on the train to Regensburg and, and try to make it right, which was exactly what Kepler did. Now, the, the problem of optimal stopping uh, is not just germane to housing and dating. It also comes up in another, a number of other contexts in life. Um, and another one that I think is, again, acute for those of us who live in the Bay Area is the problem of when to park. Um, we've all had that experience of driving down a crowded street, particularly in San Francisco, which is where I live, um, and a spot appears and you ask yourself, should I just take it and, and just commit and maybe end up walking a long way to my destination past all of these other spots and kind of feeling like a fool? Um, or do I persist in the search for something even better, knowing that in my rearview mirror someone's inevitably going to take that one and I may end up completely empty-handed? Well, fortunately, we've got the answer uh, for you in this situation as well. It turns out that the problem of when to park uh, is completely a function of the occupancy rate of the, the neighborhood or the street that you're on. And so the, the appropriate stopping threshold depends entirely on how crowded it is, uh, which makes sense. Uh, and so here we provide a complete table. In the book, you can cut it out and paste it on your dashboard if you're interested, uh, that tells you exactly how far from your destination to be willing to pull into the next available open space. And you notice a couple interesting things when you look at, the di at, at this chart. Um, the, the distance from your destination starts to go up really precipitously as you approach uh, full occupancy. So um, if with 90% of the spots filled, you can wait until you're just seven spaces away. 
Um, with 99% of the spaces filled, you have to wait, or you, you should be willing to commit 69 spaces away, which is something like a quarter of a mile in most cities. Um, if it's greater than that, uh, we recommend that you just don't drive at all and take public transit, for example. Um, and in fact, some of, the, some of this thinking has, in fact, led to a reevaluation of the problem of parking from an urban planning standpoint. Um, so traditionally, urban planners have regarded uh, public street-side parking as a resource that exists to be maximized. You know, that, it, that it's a shame to have spaces available that no one's using. And so policy was driven towards getting basically full occupancy. Um, but as has been famously argued, most, most notably by um, UCLA professor Donald Shoup, uh, this leads to crazy amounts of circling the block, holding up traffic, burning gas, all of these things. Um, and you can see from this chart that uh, going from 90% to 99% occupancy only accommodates uh, one out of nine extra cars, um, or yeah, 9% more cars, um, but it results in everyone driving and walking 10 times as far. Uh, and so armed with the, the framing of, of urban parking as an optimal stopping problem, uh, in fact, the city of San Francisco has kind of led the charge towards optimizing for 85% occupancy, which they view as kind of the sweet spot between actually using the resource of, of the curb itself um, while also minimizing the computational and fossil fuel intensive problem of parking itself. Now, you might think that the, the constraint that our decision making be totally serialized in this way is, a, is perhaps a little bit fanciful. Um, and it's true that not every decision takes on this strict form that, that parking, for example, does, or, or home buying. Um, but I think you can make the argument that in many ways, all decision making is serialized by time itself. That um, really optimal stopping is about how do, you, how do you make choices where you are paying some kind of penalty or some kind of cost to explore more options or gather more information. But in reality, we, of course, always pay a cost for exploring more options and gathering more information, and that cost is time. And so in many ways, I think you can argue that when it comes to human decision making, every single decision that we make in everyday life is a decision about when to stop. Now, the second category of problems that I want to talk about involves those which do not have this single commitment structure, but have an, an iterated nature. And many of the most familiar decisions that we make in everyday life have this kind of iterated nature where we make them over and over again. Um, specifically, they take on attention between, there's, there's a category of decisions that take on attention between doing our favorite things and trying new things, right? So the, the canonical example here is going out to eat. Do you go to your favorite restaurant or do you try something new? Um, on the way there, do you listen to a, a, your favorite record, or do you try to discover new artists, right? Put on the radio or some, some playlist that'll expose you to things you haven't heard yet. Um, and speaking of dinner, you know, who do you take to dinner? Do you take one of your closest circle of friends, or maybe your spouse, or a sibling, or do you reach out to the new coworker that just joined the office, or an acquaintance that you have something in common with and you want to get to know better? Uh, we, we intuitively have this sense that a life well lived is some kind of balance between doing the things that we know and love and always staying open to new possibilities and, and new options. Um, of course, our intuition alone doesn't tell us what exactly that balance should be. And again, fortunately, uh, computer scientists have been working on finding this very balance for the last 60 years, um, and they even have a name for it. They call it the explore-exploit dilemma. Um, now, perhaps many of you in the audience are familiar with this terminology from computer science, but for people who aren't, I just want to point out that to a computer scientist, uh, exploitation does not have the negative uh, meaning that it has in colloquial English. Um, it simply means um, using the knowledge that you've gained so far 
to get kind of a known guaranteed good payout. And so, in fact, many of the things that we associate with uh, you know, the best moments of life, you know, like a, a couple spending their anniversary together or parents spending time with their kids or, or um, you know, a book lover rereading re their favorite book, um, fall into the category of exploitation. Um, and the way that the explore-exploit trade-off rears its head in computer science um, most famously is in the context of ads. So if you put yourself into the position of Google, you know, Google makes something like 90 plus percent of their revenue from ads, right? And so for any given keyword, you have basically a choice. There's a huge pool of ads. Um, among that pool of ads, there are, there are certain ones that have historically performed the best. They've gotten the most click through um, and so forth. And there's also an, a huge pool of ads that you just simply have less information about. You haven't run them as many times. Or there's, there's an ever-growing stock of new ads that are coming into the system. And so here the explore-exploit tension becomes very explicit of literally what percentage of users see just the best performing thing that has the best chance of getting the click, what percentage of the users see new things that might be better and might be worse. In what I think is a really striking uh, example of computer science kind of resonating outward from its, itself and affecting other fields, um, a number of the results and the algorithms that have been honed, in this case in the world of ad tech, have now started to get picked up by the FDA for use in clinical trials. I don't know if the matrix is necessarily the best emblem of, of American clinical trials, um, but in a clinical trial, you have exactly this situation. You have some known best treatment, um, and you also have any number of new things that might be better and might be worse. And so which people get the experimental treatment, which people get the conventional treatment? You know, we've, we've historically answered this question by just saying, well, we'll just give half people the one thing and half of the people the other. Um, but to a computer scientist, you know, if you're running an A-B test, the idea that just half your users should see one thing, half see the other, is like the crudest possible version of, of doing that. Um, and we. We have much subtler methods, and so there's this huge argument for bringing those to bear uh, in medicine, in human medicine, where the stakes are much higher. So we'll talk about that in, in a moment as well. Um, in the uh, theoretical literature, the, the famous incarnation of the explore-exploit problem is what's called the multi-armed bandit problem. And this is probably familiar to a number of folks in the audience, but for people who aren't familiar with the multi-armed bandit problem, uh, the odd name comes from the moniker of a slot machine as a one-armed bandit. Um, and so the multi-armed bandit is basically just a room full of slot machines. So the problem goes a little something like this. You walk into a casino floor that has all of these different slot machines in it, and let's say you have, you know, you're going to be there for the afternoon. You have enough time for, let's just imagine, 100, 100 pulls. Quite simply, what strategy do you employ to try to leave 100 pulls later with the, the most money? Uh, you know ahead of time that some of these machines are going to pay out with higher probabilities than others, but you, of course, don't know which machines they are until you actually start to play. And so intuitively, your strategy is going to involve some combination of just trying things out to get information. But then at a certain point, starting to spend more of your time playing the machines that have the best odds. Although again, exactly what that trade-off should be uh, is quite hard to pin down. And so to make that point, uh, let's just imagine you're in a casino that has two slot machines. One of them you've played 15 times. It's paid out nine times and six times it has not. The other machine you've played only twice. And once it paid out and once it did not. So simply put, which machine do you play on your next pull? Well, one of the sort of naive ways of thinking about this is just to kind of think about, well, what's the expected value of each of these machines based on what I know so far? And so you know, just naively, you can say, OK, this one's paid out 60% of the time. The other one's paid out 50% of the time. So I guess I should just go with the machine that has a higher expected value. But there's also a sense in which you just don't know enough about the other machine to really write it off. So what do you do? Well, for most of the 20th century, the multi-armed bandit problem was considered not only unsolved, but unsolvable. And in World War II, the 
allied mathematicians working out of Great Britain joked about dropping the multi-armed bandit problem over Germany as the ultimate instrument of intellectual sabotage to just waste the brain power of the German mathematician. Um, but in many ways, to the field's own surprise, uh, they began to chip away at the problem uh, over the second half of the 20th century. And, and one of the first significant early results came from this guy, Richard Bellman, um, who developed a technique that could yield precise exact solutions to this problem of exactly which machine you should play based on the record of all the machines so far, uh, provided that you knew exactly how many machines there were and exactly how many pulls you were going to make and could pull off this rather sophisticated computation. Um, but the, the key insight that comes out of looking at the exact solutions that arise here um, is that your strategy should depend on entirely on how long you plan to be in the casino. And this is a concept uh, that we call the interval. So, you know, to illustrate this, imagine that you are about to take a job opportunity abroad. You're going to move to Spain, let's say, for a year. Well, the, your first night there, you go out to eat, and the restaurant is literally the greatest restaurant you've ever been to in Spain, with 100% probability. Uh, the next night you try something else, it's got a 50% probability of being the best restaurant you've ever been to in Spain. The third night has a 33% probability of being the best restaurant you've ever been to in Spain. Um, of course, the, this number starts to, to drop off um, as a result of your experience, which enables you to set a higher bar. And so just simply the, the odds of something being better than the best thing you know about so far go down the more things that you encounter. Um, and compounded with this is another thing, which is that the value in making a new discovery uh, goes down as you run out of time to exploit that discovery. So if you find a really amazing restaurant you know, on your second to last night in Spain, it's kind of tragic because you might think to yourself, well, this is really lovely, but like, I'm, where was this nine months ago when I was going to that other place all this time? Um, and so for both of these reasons, um, our strategy should naturally uh, shift from exploring the most at the beginning, when A, the odds of making a great discovery are the highest, and the value of making a discovery is the highest, um, towards exploitation as we uh, move into the, the latter part of our time. That at the end of your trip, you really are going to get the most value and the most pleasure out of doing your favorite things, because they've really established themselves as being the best among a large pool. And even if something happens to be better, which isn't likely, you don't have that much time to enjoy it. Um, now, this sort of thinking uh, that arises out of this problem has, for me personally, uh, caused me to completely reevaluate one of my favorite films, which is the 1989 inspirational classic, Dead Poet Society, uh, starring Robin Williams as the poetry Professor John Keating, who gives these really inspiring soliloquies like, seize the day, boys. Make your lives extraordinary. But equipped with the knowledge of the multi-armed bandit problem and what its optimal solutions look like, we should cry foul. Because in fact, Robin Williams is giving two pieces of incompatible advice. If we're just trying to seize the day, then let's just pull the machine with the highest expected value. But if we're trying to make our lives extraordinary, then it's worth making a little bit of an investment to explore and get some more information before we commit. Um, the, the logic of, of we are all sort of in, in any decision-making process on this continuum from exploration to exploitation as a function of where we are in this interval of time. Um, has not only been a useful concept to computer science, but it, it has now started to influence cognitive science and psychology, um, and where, where it is causing uh, a, a reevaluation of both the beginning and the end of human life. So to represent the beginning of human life, this is an infant plugging a power cord into its face. And I think that represents some of our biases about small children, that they're kind of just generally inept and random, and they have a really short attention span. They sort of relentlessly prefer new things, uh, no matter how good the toys are that you've 
chosen for them. They are always interested in something else. Um, in fact, uh, human babies are, are also kind of uniquely uh, inept compared to other mammals. Um, a baby gazelle can outrun a predatory cheetah within three hours of being born, but humans like can't really do anything useful until you know several decades into their life. Um, and so, what's up with this? So, you know, how do how do we kind of make sense of these things? Well, UC Berkeley professor Allison Gopnik has uh, leveraged the explore exploit trade-off to make an argument that you know, if you have just walked into the doors of the casino and you have 80 years, let's say, to be there, then you really should just run around spastically pulling handles at random and seeing what happens. You know, you, you really should like put every object in your living room into your mouth at least once because it could be really delicious. Um, and if it is, you have 80 years to savor it. Um, and what's more, she's, she's able to build an argument for why it might in fact be advantageous that humans have this uniquely long period of dependency on their parents, um, which is that if you are uh, su being supported by mom and dad who are giving you three square meals a day and a roof over your head, uh, then you don't have to worry about things like running away from cheetahs or catching your own food. Um, you can be focused purely on playing and learning the flute and studying arithmetic and all various things like this. Um, that if you're not dependent on those early payouts for providing you know, your lunch money, then you can just be a much more purely exploratory player in life's casino, which is in fact what you should be doing that early in the game. At the other end of life, uh, we have people in their later years, and I like to think of this gentleman as you know, sitting at the exact diner booth that he's been to you know, hundreds of times and getting the exact same soft serve that they make exactly the way that he wants it and nothing else quite matches that experience. Um, likewise, we, we have a bunch of prejudices about getting older, that we, we think of older adults as being kind of stereotypically set in their ways and stubborn and resistant to change. Um, there's a bunch of psychological studies that have shown that older adults have um, fewer s close social connections. They, they have a smaller social radius. And you know, it can be tempting to interpret this as being like, oh, well, it must just be kind of lonely to get older or they're socially isolated or things like this. Um, in fact, that's, that's not at all the picture that you'd get when you just think of the later part of someone's life as the time for exploitation. Um, and so Stanford's Laura Karstensen and some of her colleagues have uh, leveraged this intuition uh, about the explore-exploit trade-off to make the argument that no, in fact, this is exactly what rational older adults should be doing. Um, and her studies have shown that, in fact, these results about having a s fewer social ties can be explained as being a deliberate strategy that, you know, as they're, they're being more aware of the, the finitude of, of time, uh, it's just not worth trying to reach out to that flaky coworker that keeps bailing. You should really just spend more of your time on the people that really matter, um, which appears to be very much a deliberate strategy on the part of older adults. And what you'd also expect from the explore exploit trade-off is that uh, your average payout at the end of your time in the casino is going to be higher necessarily than your average payout at the beginning. Um, and so you should actually see that people's life satisfaction increases as they go through life. Um, and in fact, that's exactly what Carson said. The algorithms for the multi-armed bandit problem that get computer scientists excited, uh, ones like these, have a property that's called being minimal regret algorithms. And something I find very sort of poetic and lyrical about the multi-armed bandit problem is that it takes this vague but relatable concept of regret and makes it concrete and numerical. So you can think of regret in the multi-armed bandit problem as all of the money that you would have made had you known at the beginning everything that you knew by the end. And you can, you can fix a specific dollar value on that. And you can make claims and proofs about uh, how your regret grows over time, the gap between what you could have done and what you did uh, under different strategies. And the 
Um, there, there's good news and bad news here. So uh, it turns out that the best that you can possibly do using the, the best strategies gives you a logarithmic regret. So the bad news is that your regret will continue increasing over time. The gap between what you could have done and what you did will grow ever larger forever. Um, that's the bad news. The good news is that your, the rate at which your regret grows will go down throughout your entire life. Um, so you will always be making fewer and lower amplitude mistakes than you made in the past uh, in virtue of your experience. And, and that's something that I think we can all feel reasonably good about. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, the FDA has been really keenly interested in the idea of regret minimization in a human context, um, potentially in cases where, where lives are on the line and you, you measure regret in you know, lives lost or lives saved. Um, and so uh, starting in 2010 and then in a second document in 2015, the FDA has issued what, what's called draft guidance saying that they have taken a keen interest in these regret minimizing algorithms that computer scientists have been so excited about and using in online ad auctions for the last 15 years. Um, and in, in the, the tentative language of government agencies, they're, you know, they've expressed their interest in exploring the possibility of evaluating the potential of adopting some of these strategies, um, which in itself is, I think, a, a laudable uh, willingness to explore, even when they have something that works pretty well. And so this is a case where Understanding something about the computational structure of these sorts of problems uh, gives us not only a way of thinking differently about, you know, choosing which restaurant to go to, um, it also gives us a way of thinking poetically about kind of the arc of human life, and it also offers us some concrete suggestions in cases where the stakes are the highest. So we've looked at two of these domains. Um, and as I mentioned, the book ultimately pursues this computational lens across 12 different areas of human, human judgment, human decision making. Um, in the sorting chapter, for example, we talk about you know, what, what does computer science tell you about the best way to alphabetize your bookshelf, but more importantly, whether you should at all. Uh, in the caching chapter, we compare Martha Stewart's advice for home organization uh, with the principles of a field of computer science called caching that is equally and more rigorously involved in managing limited space uh, and seemingly infinite amounts of stuff. Um, in scheduling, we look at uh, what we can learn about human time management from what's called uh, kernel the kernel scheduler, which is a part of every operating system that tells the CPU what to do for how long and what to do next. And in our chapter on Bayes' rule, we look at uh, inferential uh, decision making and, and how to make rational predictions about an uncertain future. So everything from, you know, I've been waiting X amount of time for this bus, when do I think the bus is gonna come? To, you know, the age old problem of I've been dating this person for several months, things are going pretty well. Is it premature to book that, you know, weekend in Tahoe over the holidays? Um, we provide some concrete rational advice in, in that situation as well. Uh, and the second half of the book looks at cases where, in fact, there is no optimal algorithm that can reliably and efficiently produce uh, the solutions that you want. So what do computer scientists do in the case of so-called intractable problems? Well, there's a whole host of techniques for making progress there. Um, and they don't necessarily look like what we think of as rational decision making, which gives us, I think, a really important opportunity to interrogate the notion of rationality itself. So specifically, I think we have kind of three hallmarks of, of rational thinking as, as we kind of imagine it. it. We think of it as, in the ideal, <clears throat> exhaustive. We imagine every possibility. Uh, we think everything through to the end and, uh, and try to uh, predict every consequence of an action. Um, it's deterministic. It follows a procedure that's going to produce the same outcome every time. Uh, and it's exact. It gives us an answer that is both extremely precise and extremely certain. 
Well, faced with the TARDIS classes of problems, the algorithms that computer scientists turn to do, in some cases, none of these things. Um, they might consider just a small subset of the uh, choices and options available to them and, and aggressively prune the possibility space. Um, they might use non-determinism and randomness. One of my favorite examples of this is the algorithm that we use for generating like an SSL certificate, which involves uh, coming up with huge random prime numbers. So we need a good way to quickly determine whether a randomly generated huge number is prime or not, which is known in math as a primality test. It turns out that the best algorithm that we know is wrong 25% of the time. And so we just run it 40 times. And if it passes all 40 times, then there's only a 1 over 4 to the uh, 40 chance that we've made a mistake. And that's good enough for you know military-grade encryption, banking, all these things. Um, and ironically, we've subsequently discovered deterministic primality testing algorithms. And we still use the one that's wrong 25% it's just that much faster. Um, and moreover, uh, algorithms are, are not exact. They, computer scientists know, uh, as well as anyone, the value in approximation uh, and the value, in some cases, of trading off the certainty. Like I said, this, in some cases, an answer that is almost certainly right uh, is better than one that is certainly right but takes uh, thousands of times as long. Um, and so boiling all of this down, we arrive at, I think, a, a set of precepts that we can apply to our own everyday life. And it, it doesn't necessarily um, look like what we might think when we try to uh, apply computer science to human decision making. You know, it gives us advice like, don't always consider all your options. Don't necessarily go for the outcome that seems the best every time. Make a mess on occasion. Travel light. Let things wait. Trust your instincts and don't think too long. Relax and sometimes toss a coin. And unlike the advice that you might find, for example, in most self-help books, they come backed by proofs. So thank you very much. And I'm happy to take any questions you guys have. And I'll leave the table of comments up if there are specific things you, you want to get into. But otherwise, I'm just happy to, to talk about whatever comes up. This is on. Yes. Just a small point that all restaurants in Spain are awful. They're all selling the same garbage tapas that came out of one central kitchen that they're wa warming up in a microwave. I grew up on the, um, the Atlantic shore, and there were these two like dueling French fry restaurants that were right next to each other on the boardwalk. And the owners would just like lean out of their windows and talk trash about the other guy's fries being so bad. And it was then revealed that they were brothers and they had the same kitchen in the back. <laughs> Thank you for your talk. I'm curious, you kind of gave a brief uh, explanation of some of the topics on the left. And I'm curious by some of the titles like randomness and computational kindness, yeah. just to hear briefly about what those are about. Yeah, um, so randomness, I touch on super briefly just right at the end there talking about the, the miller rubin primality test, which um, I think illustrates that there, especially against the hardest classes of problems, there are times when we, we should be willing to do something that's not always going to work. Um, and in that chapter, we also get into you know, the, the Monte Carlo uh, method, Monte Carlo algorithms. And there's this great example of one of the uh, mathematicians and, and scientists credited with pioneering Monte Carlo techniques, uh, Stan Ulam, was in the hospital uh, playing a lot of solitaire, recovering from an operation. And being a mathematician, he just started to have these idle thoughts of like, huh, I noticed that some games of solitaire are known to be unwinnable. Um, you reach a position that's just kind of gridlocked. I wonder what percentage of possible solitaire games are unwinnable. You know, there's 52 factorial possible, you know, uh, starting positions, what percentage are unwinnable? And he starts going through, you know, the probabilities of, okay, well, the first card could be any of 52 things, the second card could be 51. 
he quickly realizes that it's just completely overwhelming to try to actually compute uh, this, you know, from in the normal manner. But on the other hand, he's just sitting there playing a bunch of games, and he has this empirical evidence that about X percent of the time, it's unwinnable. And so this kind of plants the idea in his head of Monte Carlo techniques, where, you, where you're sampling from the distribution of games rather than trying to compute exactly. Um, and I think, I think there's a very deep point there, which is that you know, sometimes the rational approach isn't to work everything out from first principles, but literally just try it and see what happens. And, and Mon I think Monte Carlo methods are an example of that. Um, we also talk about um, simulated annealing, uh, which is another family of algorithms that computer scientists use uh, in optimization contexts. Um, and you get kind of similar advice there to what I was saying in the explore exploit context, where you want to use a lot of randomness at the beginning of a process, but then sort of taper it as you, as you go along. Um, and computational kindness, so there's there's kind of a directive in computer science. I think it's unintuitive to people who are outside the field that one of the implicit premises of computer science is that computing is bad. Um, that implicitly one of the things that makes any algorithm good is that it minimizes computing. Um, and once you recognize that a lot of the problems we face in everyday life are, in a way, computational in nature, they put some sort of cognitive load on you, um, then you can take, the, uh, take that one step further and say, OK, well, the, the interactions that we have with other people put cognitive load on them, not just with the explicit things that we uh, ask of them, but also you know, having to infer our preferences from what we've said or things like that. Um, and so I think it's possible to build a, build a bridge there from computer science to a field like ethics and say, OK, well, let's imagine that we want to always act in a way which will minimize the computational burden to the other person that we're interacting with. Um, and you get a series of uh, guidelines that don't necessarily look like what typical etiquette guides would suggest. You know, Typical etiquette is if you're trying to plan something with someone be as flexible as possible or as deferential to their preferences and their needs. Um, but trying to minimize the computation on the other person might lead you to a completely different mode of interacting where you say, hey, I was thinking about having Thai food at this exact place at this exact time. Are you up for it? Yes or no? Um, and you've, you've sort of minimized the amount of labor on their side to just a single bit. Um, and so obviously, you can take that too far, but I think I think there's uh, an opportunity to really think about how we, not only how we approach these problems as the world throws them at us, be it housing or dating or you know eating out, but also a way to think differently about how we interact with one another. Uh, how was the thirty-seven percent arrived at? Not thirty-five, not forty. Okay. Well. It, to be really precise, is not 37% so much as it is 1 over E, which is actually 36.8, is this is a rational number. Um, and the proof is sufficiently detailed that I don't trust myself to go, th go over it live. Um, but it has to do with one of the, one of the key terms in the problem is uh, like minus x log x, and uh, if you graph that, you'll see that there's a function that peaks at uh, 1 over e. Um, and it has this really funny property, which is that the odds of success, oh yeah, so I should give you guys the disclaimer about the 37% rule, which is that its odds of success are also only 37%. Um, it, it fails 63% of the time. Uh, it's just that hard of a problem. There's no way to do any better than that. Um, and it, it happens to be the case uh, that all of the variations of the problem that I talked about have this symmetry between the strategy and the odds of success. So in the case where you have 50% chance of rejection, 
the optimal strategy is a uh, 25% threshold, and you also have a 25% chance of succeeding. Uh, in the case with recall, you, the optimal stopping threshold is 61%, and you have a 61% chance of succeeding, meaning getting the best candidate in the pool. And I am not a theoretical mathematician, so I do not know why that parallel holds between the strategy itself and the solution. And from my own exploration of the theoretical literature, uh, the mathematicians that actually have proved some of these things just refer to it as like amusing. Um, but I, I can't get any deeper insight into that than, than that, into, into why there's that parallel. The other disclaimer I should make is that um, the appropriate algorithm in an optimal stopping problem is uh, entirely dependent on what your definition of success is. And so the 37% rule is optimal if you're trying to maximize the probability of getting the very best thing in the pool. Uh, but it has the sort of downside that you often end up completely empty handed. Um, so if you're trying to maximize, let's say, the expected rank of the thing that you end up with, then there's a slightly different strategy. Um, so one, one of the meta themes of the book is that you know, before you enter into any problem solving context, or before you, before you try to ask the question of what should my strategy be, you should first ask the question of what exactly is my goal? And so in this case, Maximizing your chance of getting the very best thing will produce a certain set of strategies. Um, but that may or may not be how you actually want to be approaching the problem. Um, I, I really like the, the idea of, sort of min the minimizing regret sort of um, idea. And you, you sort of showed that logarithmic graph. Is, where does the, uh, where's the, the limit there? Where's the asymptotic limit? Where does that, is that sort of something that comes from the nature of the problem, like it's, it's part of the you know, the, the, the problem you approach, you sort of say, okay, this is how I define maximum regret that I sort of asymptotically approach, or does that sort of come out of the numbers somehow? Um, I think if you imagine the, like, the, if you imagine the case where there is just, you know, two machines that have two different payouts, um, and you, uh, I'm trying to think of how to articulate this. You can sort of think of it as a, as a question of sampling and like what's the, what's the error on your sampling process. Um, and for example, if you, um, if you follow a procedure where you just sample n number of times, and then from that point infinitely forward, you always do the thing that performed the best, then uh, there is some chance that you were wrong, or you, your sample produced an, you know, an erroneous thing. Um, there's some you know, fixed chance of being wrong, but then you're going to be wrong infinite number of times. And so uh, your regret your expected regret will grow linearly in that case. So this is one of the objections to randomized control trials, which is like you perform a trial, it gives you a result. There's some chance that the result is wrong, but if you then just always go with that thing into the future, then the chance that you were wrong is just multiplied infinitely forward. Sorry, you, you've fixed sort of your cost of being wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Like that, you're, and you're just running with that. Yeah, exactly. And so um, just intuitively, we should want uh, something that's known as an ad adaptive trial or an adaptive algorithm where um, you modify your strategy you know, as a result of the amount of information you have and like, never hit a specific threshold after which you feel you have the truth and just act on that. So this is one of the things that makes it not desirable from a medical perspective is that, you know, optimizing for, you know, like a, lo a lot of these multi-arm banded algorithms uh, end up used in cases like if you're, um, you know, if you're upworthy and you have all these different headlines and one of them is going to get more clicks than another, 
you don't really care about the ground truth of which headline was the best. You just want to maximize the amount of clicks. And so it turns out there's this very subtle tension between an algorithm which gives you certainty the fastest versus an algorithm which just maximizes your success rate. Uh, and so this is one of the things that is kind of controversial in a medical context. Is like, why, why should we use methods which uh, may have these uh, results that they save lives on average, but they may do that at the cost of kind of delaying the point at which we feel certain we know which drug is best. So that ends up being kind of an open question. Hi. Um, so we've kind of optimized this for um, the the computer science part of the talk. Can can I uh, can I ping your MFA? Oh yeah. Part? <laughs> um, uh, mentioned briefly, uh, kind of at the beginning about conversational UI and and using these algorithms to develop new ways that computers can interact with people. Um, and when I think about conversational UI, um, I'm wondering what we're maximizing or optimizing for because these seem very powerful and so the tendency feels like it's it's like um, those of us who work on these things are going to rush to to really like pull all these levers but it seems like in certain cases I, I'm trying to think of something off the top of my head like taking care of um, using chat bots to take care of like the elderly or something yeah. where it suddenly like are we by optimizing our quote solution are we sort of um, are we like de-emphasizing the importance or value of emotion? Like we're offloading emotional work in these sorts of things. Maybe that's yeah. sort of true with the dating thing as well. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, yeah. Thank, thanks for that question. It's it, so. My first book is about the Turing test, and so it's much more explicitly about chatbots. So it's it's fun to have the opportunity to connect dots that I maybe had had not explicitly connected across the two books. But um, I mean, I, I think the, the tension that you're describing, interestingly, has been a part of the, the conversation around chatbots since like the 1960s, 1970s. Um, famously, the, the first chatbot, the first real chatbot is Eliza, um, written by Joseph Weizenbaum at MIT, as a parody of therapy. It's, it's basically a satire of the Rogerian non-directed therapist that's like, well, what do you think? What does that mean to you? What do you, you know, what do you? You say your mother? With, yeah, it's like, um, so it was intended in a way as like a, as a critique of psychotherapy of the day. And to Weizenbaum's horror, the psychotherapeutic community said, no, wait, this is really great. This is kind of useful. Um, we should just, and Carl Sagan writes this op-ed in 1970 that's like, yeah, we should just basically have like these phone booths where people can have like, you know, pop in a quarter and get like an hour of therapy with one of these, you know, chatbots that just reflects everything they say back to them. Um, and in fact, in 2006, the British government has started rolling out a computerized like CBT for people as a way of treating like mild depression or PTSD or things like this. Um, and so Weizenbaum very famously is an example of someone who started out as, as an actual AI researcher and had this you know, moment of horror after which he, he did something extremely unusual for an academic. He basically pulled the plug on his own lab's funding like, and for the rest of his career was one of the most outspoken critics of AI research. Um, and so his argument was, you know, I don't understand how you can have a meaningful therapeutic relationship um, with something that is pretending to be a person but isn't. Um, what, what does this say about the medical establishment? Um, and I think, I mean, it's an open question. I think it's a really interesting question. So I have a question. <clears throat> There's a psychologist at Wharton, Joe Simmons, who's done work on what he calls algorithmic aversion. And briefly, it's just that when you see an algorithm and it makes a mistake, you are much more harsh to judge that than if you see a human who has a worse batting average. And so mm -hmm. as soon as the algorithm makes a single mistake, we say, okay, I would rather have a stock picker than an index fund. And so mm -hmm. 
I, I'm, it's relatively recent, but what I'm curious about is like as you've brought your book around, what kinds of algorithmic aversion have you encountered from people? Um, I mean, when I think about algorithmic aversion, you know, what comes to mind is, um, you know, this idea of how, how could you possibly reduce the complexity of human life down to the point at which the stuff you're talking about is even applicable? Um, and I think in part, you know, partly that's why I, I like to end the talk with this idea of kind of reimagining rationality, because I think in part that's based on kind of this false notion that, uh, you know, computer thinking is somehow this uh, completely diametrically opposed to human reasoning. Uh, but in fact, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the things that we think of as hallmarks of, you know, a, a computer approach to a problem, like, you know, e exhaustive, deterministic, et cetera, are just the luxuries afforded by an easy problem. And when you're up against a hard enough problem, you, don't, you can't do any of those things. And the things that you must do look a lot more like what we do when we're up against a hard problem. Um, and I think it's also important to, I mean, it's, it's, very, it's very much the case that you, know, you, you should not just literally propose the first person that you meet after you're 26 or whatever. Um, but having a, a basic sense of uh, the, the problems that we encounter in life have, a, have structure to them, an identifiable structure. And there is there's an existing taxonomy uh, for making sense of that structure. And there's a vocabulary, there's a language for both recognizing and identifying those structures and having a basic uh, game plan. So if I'm in a situation that feels like an optimal stopping problem, that doesn't necessarily mean I literally stop you know, after 37% or something like that. But I have in the back of my head you know, just a, a basic framework for how I'm going to approach this. There's going to be a looking period and a leaping period. And where that should be is going to depend on how easy it's going to be to change my mind or something like that. Um, I think those intuitions are really powerful. You know, I mean, computer science as a field, like any, any computer scientist begins attacking a problem by asking themselves what they would do if they were the machine, you know? And so programs basically start off uh, embodying human intuitions. And then through the rigor of, of computer science, they, these we start to learn something about which algorithms are better than which. We start to iterate on that, and we, we were able to kind of arrive at, a, at certainty uh, in certain cases. And so there's, I think, an opportunity to close the loop and try to reintegrate some of the things that we've learned by studying the formal versions of the problems in a way that actually bolsters human intuition. I think there's a real opportunity to do that. If there's not any more questions, oh, there's some, there are some more. Let me just remind you before we have two more questions that Brian did bring books, and he's selling them for $20, and we'll sign them afterwards. Um, hi there. Uh, I was thinking a little bit about something you said earlier around the optimal stopping problem, specifically, like you have to think about what your goals are before you define the strategy. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit, just at a high level, like if you're not so much concerned with finding the absolute best candidate in, in, a, in a set, how about just finding like better than average or finding the top quartile? Because I think it, yeah. practically speaking, it's like if I'm interviewing candidates, I, I just want someone who's, great, who's, a, who's a great candidate and I don't really right. have to, I mean, in, in terms of like the probability of success and, and all of these things, optimal stopping, does that mean you stop earlier? Um, and then also thinking a little bit about like explore and exploit. Um, you mentioned like the analogy of like, um, like listening to music over and over again, like because mm -hmm. you know something. There's also like a, a, a function of like diminishing returns. The totally. more you exploit something, the less totally. enjoyable it gets. And so just thinking about like, do these algorithms have like more complex models to oh, handle yeah. some of the the practicalities of how things actually behave? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in the case of optimal stopping, um, there's so the. The primary metric that's used in, in the literature is maximizing the probability of getting the very best thing. The, n the next most 
common metric is what's called minimum expected rank. So if you imagine running your algorithm an infinite number of times, each time, sometimes you get the first best thing, sometimes you get the fourth best thing, whatever. Which, which procedure minimizes the expected rank of the thing that you end up with? Um, there's another dimension of the problem that you can kind of parameterize, which is how much information do you know about the candidates? So in the classical secretary problem that yields the one over E rule, uh, you don't know anything about the candidates at all other than how they compare to one another. But if you're hiring for a job, let's say you're hiring for a secretary job, and there's like some typing exam, and you know that someone was like a 90th percentile score on the typing exam. Well, now you know something about them that's actually a, an objective fact about them, not merely how they stand relative to the other candidates in the pool. So the dis mathematicians call this the no information problem versus the full information problem. Uh, if you're in a full information scenario, um, you can actually succeed 58% of the time instead of 37% of the time. And the best strategy is a kind of like lowering your standards thing where depending on how many candidates are left, you set, like a, you set a bar of, okay, if there's 100 candidates left, I'm not taking anyone unless they're like a 99 point whatever percentile. And then we, we, this is another case where we just include the function in the book that you cut, off, cut out and put on your desk or whatever. Uh, that just tells you as a function of how many candidates are remaining in the pool, how, how rapidly should you start to lower your standards. Um, it will perhaps not um, console you to hear that the version of uh, minimizing expected rank with full information is called Robin's problem and it is still unsolved. Um, so the other thing is, uh, the other thing that I think is a, an extension of what you're, you're asking is like, do people actually seem to apply these things to their life? You know, like if, if you were to run a, a bunch of Stanford undergrads on a secretary problem task, would they intuitively do something that seems about right? Uh, and so in, in many of the chapters, we kind of explore this dimension of like, what is the intuitive human behavior in this situation? And in pretty much every case, it does not look like the optimal algorithm that computer science gives you, uh, which becomes an interesting opportunity to ask, which is wrong, the people or the model? And so in the case of optimal stopping, what you find is that people seem to do something that looks pretty good, but they stop earlier than they should the vast majority of the time. Um, so this was originally interpreted as you know, loss aversion or you insert your favorite sort of cognitive bias here. Um, I think one of the most interesting interpretations, someone looked at the raw data and said, you know, actually human behavior looks pretty close to optimal. If there were a 1% utility penalty being assessed for each option they consider. And it's like, okay, well that's interesting, but you know, there, there is no penalty in, in the game that they're playing. And someone realizes, of course there's a penalty, you know, this is a boring game. Um, t the passage of time is, is just intrinsically costly and bad to people. And so, in fact, it, it may make total sense that they're trying to optimize some combination of, you know, I think they get paid a little bit more every time they succeed at the task, but they also just want to be done and go on with their day. And so they're optimizing a function that sort of takes these so-called endogenous time costs into account. And this is an, another active area for researchers where they're saying like, we don't have a good way to model boredom experimentally, but it seems to be a part of the strategy people are adopting. Last question. Uh, yes, I think he kind of stole my thunder on the questions I was going to ask. Uh, in his book, Barry Schwartz, The Paradox of Choice, he talks about, um, as the decisions, the number of decisions go up, the number of choices go up, the chance for regret also goes up. Yep. As just because the stakes get higher, the more time and effort you put into investing on making the right choice, especially if you have this expectation of having to make the best choice possible. Yep. And I was wondering if, if that is also something computer science addresses, but to piggyback on that, if we live in a time now where the best choice is the thing that we're after, there obviously must be times when 
nobody expects that. And what comes to mind is the Great Depression. In those days, nobody expected to get the best choice, or very few people did. Does that change the outcome? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, there's certainly a lot of psychological things that come into play here where, you know, if I, if I just give you a candy bar, then your utility is like, wow, from zero to having a candy bar. But if I give you a choice between two, somehow we, we just in, innately want to reframe our utility just as the difference between picking the less good one and the better one. Um, which is just one of these fallacies. I think part of it is that, um, you know, we, we make the point that there's a distinction to be made between process and outcome. That in the secretary problem, following the optimal process, you, you will still fail 63% of the time. Um, but you can at least rest easy knowing you did everything you possibly could. And so that's, that's another area where I think having an understanding of the computer science under the surface of human decision making really gives us something useful, and, and in this case kind of consoling, which is that in, in any situation if we make a decision and we don't get the outcome we want, I, I think the typical human thing is to just call into question the entire decision making process of where did I go wrong, what was I not considering. And especially in the case of time, right, if you make a bad decision, like especially in a, in a business context, if they make a bad decision, you know, the executive or whoever it is gets raked over the coals of why did you not consider this? Why did you not consider that? But if someone makes the correct decision slowly, uh, they're not often raked over the coals of, you know, what, what about the opportunity cost of all the other things that you could have been doing that you sacrificed in order to, to do this with greater certainty? Um, and so I think it's important to have that counterfactual in mind also. Um, and, you know, I, I do think this is a case where at least having, having a sense of, I didn't get the thing that I wanted, but I approached it in the correct way, damn it. Uh, you know, you can at least sort of go to sleep at night without calling the entire thing into question. I think that is a way of, of just feeling better about the decisions that we make. So let's thank our speaker. Remember, he has books. Thanks.